Good morning. Today on Spotlight, inside a Detroit corporate anniversary. After 50 years of business, why does the Lewis and Monday law firm celebration stand out from the crowd? Reginald G. Dozier, an attorney, president and CEO, will tell us. We'll also analyze the wins and losses of the midterm elections through the eyes of a representative of a Michigan political family dynasty. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell of the Great Lakes State's 12th Congressional District will join us. It's Sunday, November the 13th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Uh, first, congratulations on being reelected to the 12th Congressional District. Um, you won by a huge margin. Uh, the largest margin in the Michigan delegation, so that's certainly a compliment. What do you attribute your success, and as modest as I know you are, you're not going to want to say it, but also the continuation of the Dingle political dynasty? Okay, I hate everything you just said. <laughs> okay, first that's of all, not a good way for us to start <laughs> no, this conversation. It's, um, it's going to be the new 6th district in January. Yeah. Many of us are changing numbers. Right. And quite frankly, it's, I get elected every two years. And it's not my seat. It's the people of the 12th district seat I'm serving now and the people of the 6th district. And I work hard. My job is to represent the people of my district. I try to be out. I try to be accessible. Um, it is not uncommon for me on a weekend to be at 12 or 13 places. Sure. Uh, I don't like to be staffed. I don't want an entourage because I want people to know that they can come and talk to me. I want to listen to what their issues are, and I try to fix them. I yep. try to solve problems. I dig into issues in all parts of my district. In this election, I picked up, I, I represented a lot of what I had represented. I lost Dearborn, which is still hard for me since sure. I lived there with John forever. But... I've spent a lot of time in the new areas of my district wanting to get to know people, understand what their issues are. I want to know everything. I want to know their holidays, their rituals, their traditions, who's speaking to who, who isn't speaking to who, and what they need help with. Um, what do you read out of the message from this election? So first of all, I said on Monday on Andrea Mitchell, same way I predicted Donald Trump was going to win in 2016, that I didn't think it was going to be a wave election, that I thought that there were razor thin races across the country that were a point up or a point down, that there were a lot of different issues that mattered to people, clearly. And in this state, choice was definitively one of them. But people were worried about the economy and people were worried about democracy. I, I, I think that people are reacting to the political vitriolicness, the violence that we're seeing way too easy. Uh, I think um, they want to see us work together. They want to see us solve problems. They're tired of some of the partis partisan bickering. So uh, all these races, many of these races, the races in Michigan were not as tight as some predicted. I thought they might have been um, tighter. But I, 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 the message for me out of this election is work together. We've got to f f fix the economy. You know, grocery prices are high. Gasoline prices are high. We're worried. Uh, and there are a lot of other problems that people are worried about affordable housing, education, taking care of their kids, living. People want to live in a, in a safe neighborhood and be safe. And we're politicizing issues instead of, OK, how are we going to do it? The abortion issue. Uh, normally, it's, it's Bill Clinton used to say, it's the economy, stupid. But this time, the sense is that played a huge role. Did you see those two issues almost canceling each other out or at least clashing? I think that people thought about both. I think Democrats needed to talk about a lot more than just choice. But you know, it was interesting for me as I was watching all of this. And by the way, I think it's separation of church and state. I, I would make a very different decision probably then, or would have if I was still at that age, than somebody else might have. Women who would work their whole lifetime to get more equality for women to let them have their own say over their body couldn't believe we were going backwards but young women and young men couldn't believe that somebody could tell somebody what they could do with their own body there was a generational uh, issue in there as well and I think it really stunned people what 
our court could do to people's everyday lives. And that's, you know, people are, there's a lot of things I'm worried about, Chuck. I, I heard a lot of anti-LGBT things at times in this election, and I think that horrified some people. But it, it's a complicated time, but I do think people are uncomfortable with this hate and fear that we're seeing in our communities. Some are being intentional about fanning it, and some are like, this isn't good for any of us. All right, we need to take a quick little pause for a cause. We'll come right back with more questions to Congresswoman Dingle. Stay with us. And welcome back to Spotlight. Uh, the trifecta, Democratic trifecta in the state of Michigan, first time in 40 years. They've controlled all branches of the executive wing the House and the Senate. What do you make of that? And when you talk to your friend Gretchen Whitmer, um, what are you going to say to her? Well, I have. <laughs> okay, all right. What did Actually, you say I to her? I may not see her today. I sit there. I don't know what I'm going to do having not traveled with her. I think she takes her responsibility as governor very seriously. I think it's her intent, like it is, I've said this all week too, of Joe Biden is to work with everybody. There are things that she wants to get done, and I think she's going to try to pull people together in both parties uh, to, to try to get those things done. Uh, I think that... Does it put more pressure on her yes. to have control of everything? Because a lot of Democrats say, okay, we can do whatever we want now. And that's not necessarily the message when you're trying to represent all the people. It's one of the problems that Joe Biden has had. Now, he did not have a Senate, and the Senate blocked many of the things we tried to do in the House. But people have to have realistic expectations. And you know, none of us are monolithic. Democrats aren't monolithic. Republicans aren't monolithic. I think we have to know what the issues are that we need to solve that are going to be the right things to do for Michigan. And there are a lot of problems that we have. I mean, people are worried about their kids' education. Kids have gotten behind. How are we going to make sure? that uh, we're educating all of our kids. How are we gonna make sure that we're giving our kids a good beginning, that they've got access to food? Childcare is a major problem, which Republicans and Democrats and businesses acknowledge that you can't find childcare. And that's one of the reasons we've had shortages uh, in businesses. Affordable housing is a problem. I think, but I, I, I know Gretchen Whitmer, she's not a partisan, uh, she wants to bring people together and solve problems. And so it's my hope that that's what she's going to do. We got a, a, a very important presidential election in two years. And I hope that people will have realistic expectations about what's going to happen. A lot of people were angry that Joe Biden didn't get voting rights and he didn't get. We tried. We passed it mm -hmm. in the House. We um, tried to codify Roe versus Wade. And it was stopped. So I think what she wants to do is to address the most pressing problems, find solutions, bring people together, and solve problems. Congresswoman, as we record this interview, uh, we still don't know who will control the U.S. House of Representatives, which party, or the U.S. Senate. Uh, and it could go either way. But let's do, let's speculate a little bit. If Democrats hold on to the U.S. House, should Nancy Pelosi continue as Speaker? I'm going to... Because she's been a lightning rod for controversy uh, by some. Look, and any leader is now becoming a lightning rod. I mean, that's part of what the problem is in this country, this vitriolicness, this hate, the targeting of people. Uh, I don't know what she's going to do. I have not had a conversation with her about what she's going to do, and I'm not going to politicize that. On As much as I love you, I don't want to make news this morning on that. She'll uh, make her own decision. She has been... Uh, what happened to Paul has rattled her very deeply. Uh, and ha she's made clear publicly and privately that that will impact her decision. I will say to everybody that the messages that we have to take from this election, it's a message that I have been very clear on for a number of years. Donald Trump won Michigan in 216 because he understood the anxiety of working people. He understood that they had seen their jobs shipped overseas and Democrats did a terrible job about talking about trade. I was in those union halls again, a lot of them this month. Working people want to know that who's ever representing them understands what their issues are. Those table top issues that they talk about at the dinner table. Everybody's got the same. 
They want to be able to heck, find a job that pays a decent wage, live in a home that's in a decent neighborhood and is safe and secure, educate their kids, be able to go to the doctor when they need to, afford their medicine, and have a safe and secure retirement. And sometimes we lose track of those very basic issues. If Democrats keep control, are uh, you looking forward to being part of that leadership? I'm going to try. I'm running for vice chair of the caucus. and. What I just told you is very much my message. Uh, if Republicans take control of the U.S. House, Kevin McCarthy certainly says that he wants to be Speaker. Is that Democrats' worst nightmare? I don't. I, you know, I've lived through so many pe um, people. You've, uh, uh, whoever is Speaker is going to have a hard time because w people in both parties are very good at circular firing squads. Uh, and people need to unite. And I, I think the American people sent us all a message. Go get your job done. They're tired of the games that they, they're seeing. I think Kevin McCarthy is going to have a very hard time keeping his caucus together. He's got a group of people. They're really good. At, I'm going to miss Fred Upton so much. Yeah, and you, you are. You all is, were tremendous. Well, you were tremendous friends, number one. Uh, but you also worked well we worked together, even though you were from opposite political parties. And I've already called John James. I'll be very clear with you and said, John, you and I are going to work together for Michigan. And his response? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I'm going to work with my other Republican colleagues because that's what we have to do. When it comes to fighting for the state of Michigan, we got to be together. We can't. The theatrics don't work. Uh, President Biden is embarking on an international trip uh, several countries and uh, several important missions. Um, your thoughts as he takes this trip, uh, what advice would you give him? Uh, what I, do you hope to see out of him on this? Trip? There are a lot of important issues the, that are at stake. Ukraine is something that all of us in the world are worried about. We've seen it. Uh, we need to worry about our relationship with Russia. We don't. Russia is a scary country and the man that's in charge of it some of us don't exactly know what he's up to. We have to worry about China. Uh, and I, I hope he has, that Putin is not going to the G20, as you know. Uh, China has got a lot of influence and I want to bring our supply chain home. I want our workers to be getting those jobs. Uh, but I want world stability. I want world peace. And I think the conversations he's gonna have are gonna be very critical to try to maintain world peace. Congresswoman, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming in. A uh, lot more questions I could ask and you could answer. We will get you back. I know you're back and right. forth between Washington and the district, and I promise we'll get you back. And in a few days, I think you've got a birthday coming up on November 23rd, right? I so, do. So, so happy birthday coming up. Thank you. All right, we'll be back in just a second. Uh, joining us will be Reginald Dozier of the Lewis and Monday Law Firm for a very special occasion. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Attorney Reginald G. Dozier, he is president and CEO of Lewis and Monday Law Firm, situated in the heart of downtown Detroit. Welcome to Spotlight. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Um, 50 years of that firm. I, I'm old enough to remember almost the time when they started uh, the firm, uh, different names at that particular time, but it has carried on. Um, this is significant, particularly for an African-American law firm uh, trying to operate in the sea of all these other big law firms downtown, correct? Definitely. Um, it's a big, real big deal. Um, not too many businesses, too many small businesses uh, operate for 50 years. Not too many small businesses move into like a second generation of leadership, ownership, mm -hmm. and not too many businesses um, can go on and do the things continuing in that next generation. And survive the ups and downs yes. of the economy, the competition, all of those things in a highly competitive business. And Lewis and Monday has A lot of sharks that. out there. <laughs> <laughs> in an affectionate way. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of sharks out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, you're celebrating this 50th in a number of ways. I'll talk a little bit about how you are marking this particular anniversary to, to let people know, one, what you've done, and two, where you're going. 
Very good. We have celebrated this 50th anniversary for a year. And we started off with a um, talk with the Titans, as we called it. It was a panel discussion during COVID mm -hmm. with um, David Lewis, who was one, one of the, the original founders. founding yeah. members, along with Eric Clay. The Honorable Eric Clay. The Honorable Eric Clay, who's now an esteemed judge. Esteemed judge of uh, a, the Circuit Court of the United States District's um, Third District here. Sixth Circuit, I'm sorry, Correct. Court of Appeals. Also, um, Richard White, who's formerly, who just recently retired AAA. as the general counsel of AAA, exactly. Right. And they all did pretty money. darn well. <laughs> they, they, they all did pretty darn well. But we started out with a panel discussion with them. Mm -hmm. We moved on this summer. We had a, um, uh, we had a picnic where we uh, invited our alum to come back and we celebrated mm -hmm. uh, over at Beacon Park. We also had a day of service where we did um, expungement clinic. We are forming a foundation. We have formed a foundation which uh, is instituted to give out scholarships. We're working to um, get a certain amount of money so that we can uh, extend scholarships to Detroit students, um, both students from Detroit schools and students from Detroit who are in college. What we want to do is when a student is in the 12th grade about to go to a college or university, we want to extend scholarships to them. Also students who are um, finishing up undergrad who have a desire to go to law school, we want to uh, be able to extend scholarships to those students also. We're not looking for the 4.0 students necessarily. We, we, we won't exclude the 4.0 right. students, but everybody looks for the 4.0 students. We're looking for students who- Kind of the diamond in the rough? Yeah, something like I was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you got polished up quite a bit throughout right. the years. Yeah, right. yeah. And we're looking to um, give a hand up, be of assistance to um, people with promise, but may not, may just need a little bridge over uh, the little gap. All right, we need to take a quick little break, pause for the cause, we'll come right back. And I wanna talk about some of the significant things that your firm did uh, along the way through these 50 years and a look ahead to the future. We'll be right back, stay with us. People who weren't around, remind them on how the firm got founded. Well, the firm was nice. How it, how it got to those tough, successful first years. The, well, it, it was the dream of several young black attorneys. Mm -hmm. And they had a desire to do the same kind of things that their classmates in Michigan and other schools where they had attended, um, they wanted to practice the same way that they did in terms of practicing corporate law, representing the government, representing different corporations and whatnot. So they started off, they had to do as uh, black attorneys did during that time. They had to do some criminal law and things of that nature, but they worked with an eye toward their goal of working in the corporate area mm. and um, and doing a lot of municipal work and bonding and well luckily thing. for them Coleman Young was elected mayor the year after the firm was um, established it helped and open a lot of doors Coleman that Young. would have been hard to bust through Coleman Young opened Coleman a Young. lot of doors for Lewis and Monday or then Lewis White and Clay Coleman Young saw to it that the larger law firms partnered with Lewis and Monday so that they could achieve um, the training and um, do some of the things that the other law firms were doing that Lewis and Monday's goal was to do. Lewis and Monday was the first law firm, first black law firm, I'm sorry, that uh, was placed in the bond buyer. The bond buyer is what's affectionately called the Red Book. And the Red Book is a book where municipal finance attorneys names and their firm bios are in. And the only way you can get in the Red Book is you have to have done two um, 
deals, you have to have written opinions on um, two bond deals. And the only way you can write opinions on bond deals is you have to be in the red book. So it's a circular way to keep you out. <laughs> it's a catch-22. It's a catch-22. So Mayor Young saw to it that these larger firms um, partnered up with Lewis and Monday and allowed them to do these opinions so that they could get in the red book. Therefore, Lewis and Monday was the first black law firm that was able to be admitted in the red book. And we should emphasize that in this very partisan world that we now live in, that this wasn't token affirmative action. This was an early form of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, that one, and, and I know Mayor Young was type expected, I'll open the door, but you gotta be able to deliver. And if you don't deliver the same quality service that they could get at you know, Clark Hill or Honickman or any of these other large law firms, Dickinson Wright, then you're not gonna put me on the line to be criticized too. And they did that. We went to the same law schools as the attorneys at the larger law firms. Trained by the we same took, professors. Took the same bar exam. So we are as qualified uh, as them and most of the time we only need a chance. Right. In the brief little bit of time we have left, uh, look ahead. 50 years from now, what do you see? What's your vision for this firm? 50 years from now, I see Lewis and Monday having more attorneys. I see Lewis and Monday being probably in more locations in the country. We're currently in, we have um, office and attorneys in New York. We have attorneys in um, Glastonbury, Connecticut, and Washington, D.C., in addition to our Detroit office. All right. I should ask very brief, briefly, Ruben Monday, he's doing okay? Ruben is doing fine. All right. And he was part of that leadership chain that uh, uh, made sure that it got to this 50th anniversary. He was part of that, and he was involved in many major developments, almost every major real estate development in downtown Detroit um, over the last 45 years or so. Special thanks to all of my guests today. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.